Thank you. Thank you, John. I, I'm very pleased to be with you. I am not used to standing behind podiums, so I'll meander. Forgive me for that. Um, I met uh, John. The only reason that I was able to meet John, to have the pleasure of meeting him, is because of Father Dexter. Uh, Father Dexter, uh, his generosity of heart, um, reached out to me and said, why are you staying at a hotel when you come uh, to Nashville? Please stay with us at the rectory. And so I got to uh, meet Father Dexter, and um, through him, I now have also a rectory mate, Father Mark, and I need to tell you this, I'm sure you don't know it, but you're absolutely blessed to have these two priests as your priests here. Um, they are not only holy men, which is not, okay, I'll, I'll reserve that. Uh, they are holy men, but they're also kind people, and they're intelligent, they're very bright so what a wonderful combination, and the conversations in the rectory ought to be transcribed. Not what I say, but what they say. Um, so anyway, I'm, I'm really happy to be here. Thank you so much for your, your generosity of heart as well, and for being here uh, to learn about your brothers and your sisters in the Catholic Church. Uh, one of the challenges that I have, uh, so you know that I'm a professor, so I speak in increments of 80 minutes. Um, as I, I'm sure others here who also profess uh, would, would confirm. And so it's difficult for me to gauge, particularly because I don't know the audience. Normally I know the audience. Uh, I walk in and I assume that the undergraduates don't know anything. And the graduate students who know something tell me they don't know anything either. And so we always start from scratch. So it's really good to be with you. It's, a, it's, it's my distinct pleasure. Um, I'm going to go through some slides. This first session, I'm going to go easy on you. And then we're going to do a deep dive in the second one. And then you're going to need some oxygen bottles by the time we get to the third one. Is that all right? All right. All right. Because... I have only come as of late, as St. Augustine would say, lately have I, <laughs> lately have I. So I'm, I'm, I'm a late comer to my own tradition. So I left Lebanon as an 18 year old. I barely turned 18 and came to study um, in the United States. And I went to the University of Tennessee at Knoxville. Now ask me why I ended up there. Yeah, 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 yeah. And once I got there, I guess, <laughs> I stuck, and so that's where I got all my degrees in mechanical engineering, and then we got a job offer. Uh, when we say we, by then I had a, my wife, Jocelyn, and we had already two daughters who were born at Fort Sanders Hospital. Yay! Uh, Natalie and Joanna, and so we put everybody in the car. Uh, and my mom had, had come over too, and we uh, moved to Dallas in 86, where I've been since then. I've had about four or five different academic careers, uh, and otherwise, uh, since then, without changing my zip code, including actually spinning off a company from the university. So I've dabbled in being a lousy president CEO of a company, which I'm happy to tell you now is a failed company. <laughs> All right. So that's a, you know, I, I'll sprinkle some of these. Ask me any questions you like. Yes? Uh, the only thing that you need to know is that I have memorized my presentations. So you can ask questions, interrupt me at any point in time, but if you do, I must start again at the beginning. <laughs> so, hey, you know, we, we might not get through a lot of slides. So, no, I'm just kidding. Please interrupt any time you like. So we're here to exchange ideas. I'm not here to teach you anything. We're just here to converse and talk about part of our faith, yours and mine, that I was not aware of. Pope St. John Paul II, um, our great John Paul, uh, said in one of his encyclicals that the church must breathe with, with her two lungs. And he was thinking about the Greek lung and the Latin lung. Who am I to correct the great John Paul? Uh, but I think he left out <laughs> some other lungs, and, and especially 
the Syriac lung, because I don't know how we would survive without the Syriac, Syriac lung, and so I hope to share with you some of these things. But first, before we begin, uh, I'd like for us to pray a prayer of St. Ephraim. Would you join me in an attitude of prayer? Okay, so St. Ephraim says, let us bow. So I'm going to do that. St. Ephraim bows, and then, of course, you don't have to bow again. So I can't read that, so I'm going to read from here. I'm an old man. I don't know if you've noticed, so I, I, I you know, I've got to do this. O Lord, master of my life, grant that I may not be infected with the spirit of slothfulness and inquisitiveness, with the spirit of ambition and vain talking. Let us bow. Grant instead to me, your servant, the spirit of purity and of humility, the spirit of patience and neighborly love. Let us bow. O Lord and King, grant me the grace of being aware of my sins and of not thinking evil of those of my brethren. For you are blessed now and forever and forever. Now and ever and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Amen. Father Dexter, hello, my brother. Uh, you, all know, you all know Tony, right? He's my compatriot over there. Teresa, actually, I don't know, she's... We're going to have our liturgy at 2 p.m. in the afternoon at the, 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 the Catholic Church of the Korean Martyrs. Uh, and so she's going to have enough of me today. She's going to see me morning and afternoon. This is a beautiful prayer. Um, so you notice that Ephraim was born in 306. So that's uh, the beginning of the 4th uh, century. But I want to actually jump all the way to the 19th century to one of our, uh, one of our several uh, canonized saints in the in the Universal Catholic Church by the name of Saint Sherbel, Saint Sherbel Makhlouf. Have you, anybody heard of Saint Sherbel? How many miracles does it take for someone to be canonized? Well, one to get the process going, I guess two more and you're canonized, thereabouts. But if you're a martyr, it's like you don't need any miracles, right? He's at about 26,000 and counting. So he's got some to spare. So look him up. It's amazing. Miracles in the United States, in Africa, among Muslims. In Lebanon, even the Muslims and the Druze make pilgrimage to, to his monastery and to where he's buried. And he said something that I think grounds us for this Lenten journey, because I'm, I'm here to, not to talk about only the Syriac tradition and Christianity, but to encourage us to make this Lent like no other Lent before. If you get nothing out of what are we going to talk about, please, let's all make this Lent like no other Lent before. Let's make it a profound Lent. St. Sherbel says, start nothing on earth unless it has its end in heaven. Wow, what a perspective. It's, you know, anagogical perspective. Do not walk on a path that does not lead to heaven. He basically simplified life. He's a hermit, by the way. He was allowed to become a hermit in the last 16 years of his life. You have to, he's a monk, so he had to ask permission to become a hermit. And finally, his um, abbot allowed him to go to the hermitage uh, there and live by himself. There was one other hermit in the hermitage, but of course, you know, they, you know, they, they got their own lives. Uh, you will get a lot more why hermitage is really important to the, to the Syriacs. There is this uh, need for ascetism, this desire of truly what St. Paul asks us to do, which is to renounce the earthly things and lift our eyes to the godly things. And so they took it very seriously. And, and you know that in the beginning, um, they went out to the desert. Um, in fact, the, the Syriacs, the, the originators of the Maronite tradition, went out to the deserts, but they were not in the deserts of Egypt, prior to St. Anthony of the desert. So they, what we'd call them the proto-monastic movement. So when I say proto-monastic, it means it's prior to. And they lived as individuals 
in the imitation of Jesus Christ, but you know what they did? They were men and women. They actually built their cells and attached them to the side of the church, which is amazing. So they were living alone, but they served the church. And so did he. He never, whenever he was called to somebody's deathbed or somebody ill or to celebrate the liturgy, he did it. He was a hermit, but he participated in the communal life, the liturgical life, because we cannot have faith that is not professed and that is not exercised, right? So our faith then has to come into practice. And liturgy actually teaches us the faith. If you look behind you, you will see an icon. It's an icon of the three angels, or maybe it's the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, that went to see Father Abraham and Mother Sarah. This is not, you don't say, I painted an icon. You say, I wrote an icon, because icons are catechetical. An icon teaches us people did not read and write. And so how do you teach them the faith? My grandmother, may she rest in peace, Helen, taught me the faith as a, as a young boy. She was illiterate, but she knew her faith inside out. I promise you, a saintly woman. I never met anyone like her in my life. Maybe I'm a little biased. She's my grandma, but, she, you know, she saintly woman. And so these icons actually taught lessons. So when you walked into a space of liturgy or even at home, the kids would ask, Mom? Why are they like that? And they have different color tunics, and there is an open place there in front, and what do they have at the table? This is a beautiful reflection. I've actually reflected on it in, in, in homilies before. Think about it. It's an invitation. They're drawing you in. Come and have supper with us. Come and have communion with us. There's a fourth place. That place is for you and me. And so this is the sort of intuition that we want to have. This is the sort of intuition that he had Begin nothing on earth, because this is the purpose of your life. My purpose here on earth is what? When is the last time you saw a hearse pulling a U-Haul behind it? <laughs> what is it? Tell me. If you've seen it, I want to know. I want to take a picture. Right? So never do anything that doesn't end there. Now, our season of, we call it the season of glorious Lent, in our liturgical life. This is not our liturgical year, by the way. This is the, uh, I mean, it's not the Maronite churches. This is the, the Latin church. Um, it goes into a, 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 a cyclical thing. It's a spiral. It begins again and begins again and begins again. But it's not flat. It's a helix, and it's rising and rising and rising. And so every year, the Lord gives us the opportunity to look at where we are from a different perspective and to grow in faith so that we can ascend closer and closer to him. Now remember, we can never reach him. You will get this out of the talks that I will give. The Maronite tradition is apophatic, what's known as apophatic. I mean, it, it, is, it starts with, there's no way that I can know anything about God unless God reveals himself to me. So it's not speculative. It doesn't try to dissect God. So in our world, if you say, how would you get to know your mother? We would say, don't dissect her on the table. Just hug her and love her. That's how you know your mother. So that's the approach that we have. It's not a dissecting approach. It's more rather um, of an embracement approach. And so what we do is we hear in Advent, like the, 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 the shepherds, we hear like the stars about the coming of the Lord. Oh, we hear it. Okay, I hear all sorts of things. I, I hear an ambulance go by. I hear the birds chirping. What does that mean? I just heard it, that's all. Did it register? Did it change me in any way? Then what we do, the Lord tugs at my heart, and then we listen. We listen. And then after we listen and we know more, we begin to wonder. Now we say, oh, I wonder, why am I here? Whom do I belong to? What is the purpose of my life? How does this play into my life that I've heard, that I've listened to? And then we rejoice. When do we rejoice? We, so we wonder at this Lenten time, and then we rejoice in the, Easter, in the Easter cycle at the Tridium, because at the end of the Tridium, we have the resurrection. 
But then we're not done. What do we do then? We proclaim, right? That's our job, to go out and proclaim. The Mass has ended, right? What do we do now? Go for the donuts. <laughs> the most important thing for us right now is we are in Lenten period. We are in the wonderment period. We're wondering. We're wondering about ourselves, about what the Lord has done for us. And so that's the attitude that I would like for us to have whenever we're thinking about this Lenten journey. All right. Now, let me give you a little outline. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do some very brief introductions. I'm sure you're very curious about who is this guy and why does he wear not exactly the same color as Father Dexter and why does he call himself Catholic, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm going to tell you a few things about the Maronites, about Lebanon, about the Christians in Antioch. And then I'm going to talk a bit about the Syriac language because it actually influences. Uh, and I promise you next time I'll bring you some handouts. Um, I, I failed to do that this time, but I'll bring you some handouts. And then the origins and development of, of Syriac Christianity, and then some selected main concept, because these concepts are really, really important for our Christian life, I think. And I think you'll agree with me once you hear them. And then we'll go as far as we can. I'm, only, I'm here every other week, but God willing, you know, maybe John will in, invite me again, and we'll continue the journey together should the Lord give me life and give us an opportunity. So don't worry, you know, we'll get as much as we can uh, out of this. Got to watch the clock here. There's no watch. There's no clock around. So just so you know, the branches of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. So where did we begin? We began, obviously, in Jerusalem. And immediately after Jerusalem, the disciples, the apostles, started going out and preaching the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ crucified and raised from the dead. This is essential. And so where did they go? Well, they went to various places. They started going to, maybe not in that order, but certainly the Alexandrian church in Alexandria, currently in, in Egypt. And you have to realize that this was a very Hellenistic center. And so uh, they were Greeks, of course, they were Jews, but they were also Egyptian ethnicities. And when I mean e Egyptian, I mean those who actually worshipped uh, Allah Egyptian way. Right? So, you know, the, 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 all that, that came with it. And then, of course, then they also went to uh, Antioch. And so the Antiochian church was a nexus of Semitic and also uh, uh, pagan, uh, Hellenistic, but there were a lot of Jews, a lot of Jews in Antioch. Now, after that, of course, they went into Armenia. Armenia, for, by the way, is the first is the first state that um, adopted Christianity as its um, religion. Incidentally, um, our brothers and sisters, Armenian brothers and sisters, need our help, brothers and sisters. Uh, you may not be aware of this because the, the media doesn't talk about it very much, but there's been recently a, a genocide there, and they, the Azerbaijanis have actually occupied a whole part of, of what used to be Armenia. But Noah's Ark, for heaven's sake. You know, so this is basically very traditional. And now there is a threat that actually, they, because of the world being busy with all that is going on, that they will actually go in and take a lot more. And so the Turks and the Azerbaijanis um, may be invading Armenia. So if, if that comes to your attention, you may be speaking with somebody of influence. I think it's good for us to uh, let the I am not Armenian, I'm not saying this, but, but it's important because they are our brothers and sisters. Um, and then after uh, Armenia, there's the Chaldeans, and the Chaldeans were Semitic settlers, and they settled there uh, probably about you know, 10 centuries before Christ. And so you remember, right, all the Jews would you know, be hauled off to Babylon, hauled off here, hauled off there. Well, they stayed, many of them actually stayed, and they kept their, their traditions. And then what happened, of course, we know about the, the Byzantine tradition. The Byzantine tradition um, in what's known as Constantinople. Today it is Istanbul. Very good. And so that is very um, empire-like because this is, you know, the, 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 the Roman emperor decided, why should I be at the edge of my empire? I need to be in the center of the empire. So that's when they moved 
the, the, uh, the seat of, 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 of the Roman Empire from Rome to Constantinople. And so that's very much of an imperial place. Now, this is important. I'm not just saying this just for, for fun. Imperial. Remember that. If you're a patriarch and you're lunching and dining with the emperor, what do you think of yourself? Big deal. That's right. Because you're with the emperor. You're like two, two stones away from, uh, uh, a, a stone throw away from the emperor. Same with Rome. Rome obviously was the original seat of the Roman Empire. Now, I'm here to tell you, of course, Saints Peter and Paul were martyred in Rome, and this is why Rome has always been, and don't let anybody tell you otherwise, first among its brothers and sisters. Even in the early days of the church, whenever there were issues, they would send word to the bishop of Rome and ask for his adjudication. So from the early days, why? No one can deny that St. Peter's and St. Paul, St. Peter, St. Paul actually died uh, in Rome, and this is the, an important seat for our Christianity. Now, is Jerusalem not important? Of course it's important. We have to keep remembering that. Um, but Jesus, whenever, when he rose, he, did, he tell the, did he tell the disciples, did he tell Mary Magdalene to go tell his uh, apostles, his disciples, to go meet him? in the temple in Jerusalem? No. He said, tell them to go meet me in Galilee. That's right. That's right. Already on the move north. Spent most of his time actually in Galilee, southern and northern Galilee. Now, what's interesting about this is that your perspective and mine until the age of about, uh, I would say, probably 50, 60, 58, 60, was that, yeah, who cares? <laughs> billion and growing, maybe a couple hundred million, maybe a hundred million, I don't know, really, just, you know, like, who cares, right? Well, we need to care, and I'm, I'm here to tell you that we do need to care. So let me tell you about the 23 rights of the Catholic Church. Anybody recognize the picture there? Can you see it? What is that? Yes, but, but I took this picture through a keyhole. Has anybody been there to the Maltese, the, 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 what do you call them, the dames and the, the, the knights of Malta? They have a, a home, a house. You can't go in. I can't. I'm not. But through the keyhole, I was able to take this picture. It's a, it's a, it's a very interesting place. Okay, so we have a Latin church, Roman. How many churches? Uno, one Latin church. We have an Alexandrian church, Northeast Africa. There are two of them, the Coptic and the Ethiopian. When I say these things, remember, a lot of these are uniate. Uni they united themselves back to the pontiff, the supreme pontiff to Rome, as of late, not necessarily in the early. And I'll tell you more about them as we go along. The Antiochian on the Orentus River, there are three of them, they're also known as West Syriac. And uh, there's the Maronite, the church that, that, that I belong to. There's the Syriac church, and then there's the Syro Malankar, the Syro, Syro Malankara, or the Syro Malankar. In India, they call themselves the church that St. Thomas built. Yes. And then there's the Armenian church in Eurasia, one. Uh, there's a Chaldean church, Eastern Mesopotamia. There are two of them. They're also known as East Syrian or East Syriacs. Chaldean and Syro Malabar. So the Syro Malabar and the Syro Malankar are actually separate from each other. And then finally, uh, and most importantly in terms of numbers, there are 14 Byzantine churches Albanian, Belarusian, Bulgarian, Croatian, Serbian, Montenegroan, Greek, Hungarian, Italian, Albanian, Macedonian, Melkite, Romanian, Russian, Ruthenian, the biggest one. Slovak, and Ukrainian. Ukrainian source is huge. So what do you notice when I show you all these words? Yeah. They're national, they're ethnic. They're ethnic. Is our Roman Catholic Church ethnic? No. 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 But they're ethnic. Uh, very interesting, right? Very interesting. So we should keep that in mind, that ethnicity plays an important role 
in the development of those churches. Did ethnicity play an initial role in the development of the Latin church? Well, duh, yeah, but not for a long time, right? Not, not, since, not, not since a long time. Okay, we have a common faith, we have unique traditions, we have commonality in dogmatic faith and moral teachings. We have seven sacramental, we don't call them sacraments, we call them mysteries. They're called mysteries. Actually, we have a little bit more than seven. What we call sacramentals in the Roman Catholic Church, some of those we would actually refer to as sacraments or as mysteries in the, the Eastern churches. We have communion with the Bishop of Rome. Very important. There is a last voice, a last word, a last decision. We can argue, but at the end of the day, when he says, it is so, it is so, we're done. We don't argue forever. Um, we have diversity, though, in liturgy, theology, spirituality, discipline, cultural and linguistic traditions, and also church leadership. Some, like the Maronites, have a patriarch because we belong to the original Antiochian uh, tradition, so we have a patriarch. Others have a metropolitan. Metro comes from basically a larger uh, we still, and, and here in the, in the Latin church also we have metropolitans in some sense. We call them archbishops, and they're responsible in some sense for their brother bishop. They, they're, not, they're not higher than them in terms of holy orders, but they have uh, uh, administrative uh, responsibilities uh, over um, their suffrages, I guess, the, 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 the others. And so they vary. They're very, very different. Now, when I say tradition and I speak about discipline, of course, we're not going to spend a lot of time on those things, but we're going to spend time on the spirituality. But tradition and uh, discipline is also important. Celibacy, I'm a married priest. I'm here to tell you that half of my brother priests, more than half, in the Maronite church are celibate. And we value that. And, and, we, and I personally think it has immense value. Celibacy does. But we also have married priests. Now, is that dogmatic? Is that in the Bible? No, you would call that a discipline of the church, meaning it is open to, to change. Now, it's not going to change anytime soon, but it, you know, here, here, here am I, Lord, take me, right? So, yeah, yeah, I'm married, right? I'm a grandpa. So, but I have brothers who are not married, and we are equal in the dignity of the priesthood of Jesus Christ. So, that's a discipline. Now, how do you explain it? Because people ask me a lot about that. So the way I explain it, the way that I, we should explain it, if you don't mind, is like this. When Jesus called you, were you standing or sitting? Were you married or single or widowed? That's it. That's all there is to it. When the Lord called Peter, Peter was married. And what did Jesus say to him? He said, the first thing you do is you go divorce your wife, and get away from that no good mother-in-law of yours. <laughs> and then come and follow me. No, he didn't. Now, St. Paul, we don't know. Maybe he was widowed. Maybe he was never married. Uh, now, there is a tradition you have to remember. Uh, old tradition, this is why we have it, is to live as a celibate person. Uh, the Essenes, for example. So there were these traditions within the Jewish a community. Not everybody got married and hauled off at the age of 13 or 14. There were men and women. We believe, for example, that Joseph and Mary belonged to such a tradition where they would basically give their lives, uh, give up their sexuality. It doesn't mean they gave up their love, but they gave up their sexuality uh, for a higher good. And, and, and it's lovely and it's wonderful and, it, and, and we, should, we should celebrate that in our church. But that's called a discipline and not anything that's dogmatic. Okay, now the Eastern Catholic traditions, you would see a lot of places um, there are no pews. You stand. Now, we have pews, the Maronites. Of course, there are always chairs for the elderly and those who can't possibly uh, stand, and so they would sit. Um, you would also find that you've got not icons, uh, icons but not statues. So that's another difference that you would see if you went to a, uh, an Eastern church. The inner sanctum, or the Holy of Holies. Now, we, the Maronites, do not have an iconostasis. 
like the Eastern Orthodox. Like you've got a wall, basically the priest goes in, does whatever the priest does with the, with the deacon. The deacon has a door, the priest has a door, St. Michael has a door, and they come out and they say, pay attention, and then they go back in and, and the people basically go and they light candles and they do their private devotions and private prayers. And then a deacon comes out and says, pay attention, you know, and then we pray and then they go back in. So it's not like that. There's no, you know, but you know where the Holy of Holies comes from, right? The inner sanctum. It, it's very Jewish because, you know, this is what, what you did. So there's still that tradition. But in our case, for example, in the Maronites, there is, we, we're not sure. We've been very Latinized. Um, there used to be a curtain. And at the creed, the curtain would open and would reveal the altar. Okay? Now, why do I think that? What happened when Jesus died on the cross? We read that the veil was torn down the middle from top to bottom. What is reveal? Revelation. Revelation, sometimes we think, is basically to make that which was hidden not hidden. But it's a Latin word. Re, velar. Velar is veil. Re is to again, is to veil again. Now before, there was a veil that separated us mere mortals from the Holy of Holies where there were essentially three things. Think about it. The Ark of the Covenant, the Shekhinah, the presence of God Almighty. On your right, you would have the showbread. Bread, interesting. Huh? On, the, on the left side, you would have the menorah. When we talk about the Holy Spirit, how do we describe the Holy Spirit as what? Fire. Fingers of fire coming upon the heads of the apostles and our mother Mary, right? And the upper room and, and the disciples who happened to be there. So it's beautiful, right? Already we had Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We just didn't know it. But, but that veil there, the veil, is no longer necessary because God does not reveal more of himself than we can withstand. Remember what happened to Moses. He just passed by, and he, God, he stuck, was luminous. Nobody could look at him. Like, you know, I just, you know, if you see God, you will die. And truly, we, you and I also will, will die, except that now we don't need that veil anymore because who's our new veil? Jesus Christ himself. Jesus Christ himself reveals the Father to us, and then, of course, we got the Holy Spirit to boot, which is amazing, Right? I mean, that's what we need to meditate on, is that, wow, what a gift. Condescension, the gift of condescension from our Lord Jesus Christ. And you will always find a chuppah. And the chuppah, the dome, we, at St. Peter's Basilica, what do you see over the altar? You see a chuppah. And so this is traditional, so you will see a lot of chuppah, so now you know what those chuppahs are. Okay, what about the Maronite Church? Briefly. Goodness, we're not making very good progress here. Yeah, you're asking too many questions. Uh, it follows the Antiochian uh, tradition. It dates back to early Christians in Antioch. First bishop of Antioch was St. Peter himself. Uh, the first uh, preacher or one of the first main preachers would probably have been Barnabas, but he went off and got Saul, Paul. So that's what... Um, it dates back, uses Syriac dialect. Di it's a dialect of Aramaic, um, and I'll tell you where it came from uh, shortly. Uh, Jesus did not speak Syriac. Jesus would have spoken Aramaic. Aramaic was a, a spoken language because people didn't write very much, because when they wrote, they would have written in Greek, exactly, or in Hebrew. So Aramaic was not, but it was the day-to-day -day conversation would have been in Aramaic, Syriac was a written language, and furthermore, it was a liturgical language, and so it's stuck. Uh, and it's, it's a derivative, basically, of Aramaic. Uh, steeped in monastic tradition, to this day, maybe not to this day, but until very recently, like maybe a couple of decades ago, whenever they chose a bishop, Maronite bishop, they went to the monasteries, and they picked somebody from the monastery. Why? You're sure they were never married. And so in our tradition, to be a bishop, you cannot be a married priest and become a bishop. And so the bishop is an unmarried celibate priest. He becomes a bishop. 
And so the, um, the monastic tradition dates back to St. Maron. I, I think the Maronite church is probably the only church that's named after a person. Uh, it's after Maron, M-A-R-O-N. It's not marionette, and it's not Marionite. That's different. It's Maronite. It's Maron, St. Maron. Um, he, by the way, died in 410 A.D. We believe that he was the spiritual director of, uh, in some sense, uh, spiritual father of St. John Chrysostom. There's even a letter from St. John Chrysostom to uh, St. Maron asking about his health and, you know, basically a, a, a beautiful, beautiful letter. Um, but, of course, who knows? You know, these are old traditions. You're not sure. Uh, but he was a hermit priest. And so this is why the, uh, these followers became Beit. Beit in uh, Syriac means the house of Beit Maron, Beit Marun. Uh, they were monks, and this is, they lived a life of monk hermits themselves. Not all of them become priests. Some stay brothers, but they live as hermits. It was influenced by Antioch, which is obviously a center, as I said, of Greek and Syriac uh, commerce. Edessa, Edessa and Nisbis, Further to the east, northeast, they were very much influenced by these centers. And there you had Semitic culture. It's the home of St. Ephraim, whose prayer we prayed at the beginning. And St. Ephraim, uh, 300, as I said. Uh, and, then, and then they, because of the Jacobites, um, so the Maronites uh, stood by Chalcedon and, and stood by basically the, 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 the churches a view of one nature, two persons. At the time, they, they didn't worry about the, the, the Holy Spirit yet. They were still figuring out what the Holy Spirit is. But certainly between God the Father and God the Son, one nature, two persons. Now, the Jacobites, monophysites, they didn't weren't too happy with that, and they actually killed about 100, 150 uh, Maronite monks. So the monks fled into the mountain of Lebanon, and that's a barrier, a geographic barrier, and they, they were able to basically uh, protect themselves over there. And then the Byzantine soldiers, who were not Byzantine themselves, they were not Greek, called the Marada, stayed there, didn't want to go back. That's why they called Marada means to, to revolt against. And they became the, 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 uh, the military arm of the Patriarch of Antioch, the Maronite Patriarch of Antioch. Of Antioch. This is early 600 now, I'm telling you. So this is kind of, they were protected by the mountain. The mountain made them, and they made the mountain. And it's very, very interesting how, for another day. Um, and their liturgical life, they're, they're very important because catechesis through liturgy is part of who we are. We catechize through our liturgy. Our liturgy is catechetical in our tradition. Why? Because people, again, didn't necessarily have access to books. Uh, not everybody knew how to read and write, and, you know, printing presses and all that didn't come around until the, for us, I know 1400, Gutenberg, but for us probably it was like the 1500s by the time it got there. And so the Maronite Patriarch of Antioch governs the church in a very synodal fashion. He does not, for example, he does not have the authority to remove a bishop. So he, he is the head of the church, the Patriarch, and he has the final say in everything liturgical and all that, but he governs in a very synodal way with about, there are about 40 some odd uh, bishops now, Maronite bishops. So that's how it operates, the Maronite uh, church. Okay? He happens to be a cardinal. He doesn't have to be, but he happens to be a cardinal. He's also a cardinal, bishop cardinal. You know, there's a deacon cardinal, there's a priest cardinal, there's a bishop cardinal. The patriarchs don't go through the ranks. They immediately become... Uh, bishop cardinals. In fact, he probably occupies now the first seat uh, at the next enclave. He would be seating if you, you will see them before they lock the doors. Maybe they'll have a picture or something. Look for him. He'd be sitting right there, first chair, because he is the elder uh, statesman, so to speak, of, of, the, of the cardinals. Yes, John? Uh, we need to start from the bottom. Uh, standing. Breath violent. The threat of violence uh, got them to leave uh, what would be today southern Turkey. Um, 
uh, northwest Persia, the Parthians, the, the Persians, they left and went south and lived in the mountains of, of Lebanon. Now, Lebanon was already occupied by pagans, and Mount Lebanon particularly, and they worshipped uh, the uh, a, a god of uh, wine and the god of love. Um, and, but, miraculously, the arrival of the Maronites turned that entire mountain into Maronites. Uh, so that the memory of violence never leaves you. For example, how would the Armenians ever forget it with all the genocides that they've... Uh, we would never forget it. I mean, our people actually lived in, you couldn't see it, it's too small, the, 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 the screen there, but they actually lived in, in, uh, in rock grottos. <laughs> I mean, yes, of course, it's part of what makes you. Uh, in fact, uh, ethnic or genetic analysis of late, recent, uh, they, they took swabs of 20-some-odd you know, thousand people, 10,000 of them were from the mountains of Lebanon. They found less than 10% mixing with other people. They had been there for over seven to 10,000 years in the mountains. All that happened is that they were pagans. They, uh, they worshiped Ash Ashtrut, Ashtrat, what do you call her? I don't know how you, you say it. And Adonis, Adonis and Ashtarut. And now they became <laughs> Maronites. They became Christians. And so yes, they, it's always close by this idea of uh, being persecuted. And, I, and I'll show you why. I'll show you why in, in, in a minute. Of course, we have the married priesthood. We already talk about that. Forget about that. Deacons, for example, in our, uh, in our um, theology, spirituality, do not have the, the, uh, the office of the blessing. Therefore, they cannot officiate at a wedding. They cannot officiate at a baptism. They cannot officiate at a funeral. Only priests and bishops can do that. Father. Wait, Paul, God, what's in my God, when you liturgy. It's a very interesting question. Does the liturgy contain in it a memory of violence? Now that you mention it, I hadn't thought about it before, I think it has in it a reflection of violence. Because again and again it points to the protection and the mercy of God. Now that you mention it, I, you know, I never thought about that. That's very interesting. So it doesn't, it doesn't go into the violence per se. Of course, in the Synaxirion, you know, when you read about the, um, a particular feast, you learn about the history and all that, they will mention the, what happened and all that, the martyrs and all that, yes. But the liturgy itself doesn't, but in it again and again and again and again, it's all about the protection of God and the umbrella of God and putting yourself under, the, uh, under his umbrella and his protection. So yes, in, in a sense, it's part of who, what makes us uh, Maronites. The Maronites are very much people of the mountain. In fact, when they went into the, over the centuries, eventually they made their way down into the, 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 the seashore, the Mediterranean shore. It's not that far. You just got to go down the 11,000 uh, feet, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's mountains. But eventually they made it and the way that they lived in the seashore is identical to how they lived in the village. And this is how they lived in the village. Church, community around the church. Church, community around the church. So they are very, very much of people of the church. And they remain true to that village life. Even though they lived in the city, they lived their village life in, in the city. Somebody here was raising it. Yes, ma'am. I wonder when they moved when the monks went into the, the caves, why did the soldiers go after them? What drew them there? So they used to be, uh, they used to be basically um, monophysites, uh, emperors and leaders who would go along with Arian. Arianism was very, very um, active those days and powerful. Even some of our bishops became 
you know, Aryans, um, and then, you know, Marcionites. And so they, anyway, so they, um, they would sick some of the, the soldiers to go and, you know. So they were set to. Yeah, but, but they became Maronites and they stayed there. And so, um, I yeah. I what drew them. Yeah, so they would have been sent basically to punish. Okay. And uh, monks turned them into, uh, into Maronites. Yes, ma'am. I'm curious about John and Father Dexter's comment about violence in the king. He got the fraud, the content. Mm -hmm. So I, I think I'm missing something about this is his question to share. Right. How much of the initial violence would have survived in the liturgy? Is probably the, the, the how I, I would I would phrase the question. And if you go back to the writings of Ephraim and Afrahat and and uh, they their writings and their homilies, some of them would be very uh, polemical. They'd be you know they would be uh, you know pushing back against people who were basically opposing them, including uh, uh, Jewish. Uh, at some point, they they started separating. So so they were polemics, and they were, but but it's not in the liturgy itself. It would be in the homilies that we still have, and the writings we still we have hundreds of thousands of parchments, and you know things that remain from those days. So there's a deep history of those, and some of them were are historical accounts. So they would have they would go into th those as well, John. Bless you. So it's about the Christian. Not all of them. So they were Christians against Christians because of the Christological issues that we had, uh, the heresies. But then, so I'll come to it, but I'll skip it because I'm talking about it now. Uh, for example, the the Persians thought the Christians were the cat's meow, the Parthians, thought that the Christians were the cat's meow and did not hurt them at all because Rome was persecuting them. And since the Persians hated Rome, they thought, well, anybody who hates these people so badly couldn't be that bad because if the Romans hate them, then we shouldn't hate them. Now, after the Edict of Rome, 313-ish, something like that, the Parthians persecutions of the Parthians exceeded anything that the Romans ever did. I mean, manifold, because now the Roman Empire said, oh, the Christians are good. So now the Persians, the Parthians said, well, they must not be good at all. Let's go out and impale them and uh, crucify them. Crucifixion, by the way, was not a Roman invention. It, it came to them from the Parthians. It, it's, uh, it's important. Uh, but they, they, of course, mastered it very well. They did it extremely well. So that, I think, is, is the issue, is that not only Christian against Christian, but also you have to remember, one of the reasons that on the left side of that red line, we have, oh, yeah, and on the right-hand side of that line is, who cares, is because to the right of that line in the east, there was never a moment of non-persecution. You have to remember now that in the, in the middle 600s, who comes along? Islam. Hello? So, you know, it was, you know, Hagia Sophia is today, until recently, it wasn't. It was a museum, but now it is a mosque. So they were always persecuted. So they would always find refuge in mountains and, and behind some barriers, ge geographic uh, barriers. Okay, uh, cedars of Lebanon, you heard about them? This is me and, and, and this is my family here in front of a cedar that's about, it's over 2,000 years old. This is Beshari. How many of you have heard of a guy by the name of Khalil Gibran? Uh, wrote the, uh, yeah, so he's buried in Beshari. This is his village over there. It's a beautiful village. This mountain here is where I used to ski as a kid and if you look this way, that's where they, uh, you would see this. If you, from this village, you would look that away. Um, these are the grottos that I was telling you about. This is where the hermits would live. This is called Kadisha. Kadish, Kadesh, 
in Semitic languages means blessed or um, holy, holy. So this is the valley of the saints. So we have so many saints that came out of this valley. It's very close to Bishari. This is a hole in the wall. It's a room. Of course, now it's open, but you would have never guessed that. And it was where the patriarch hid in the 1700s. And they actually closed the wall on him because when they came to look for him, they couldn't find him because there was a wall. So he was actually entombed, so to speak, in, in his rooms. It's not very big. I've been in there uh, and had to live there for a while uh, so they can protect the patriarch because they came to kill the patriarch. So this would be the Ottomans by that time. The nice Ottomans. Um, we have Our Lady of Lebanon, Harissa. This is a top view. They built this beautiful basilica. This is Harissa. It's very, very, very tall. You can stand on top. This is the view of the Mediterranean uh, from there. I would, from my house in Beirut, to me putting my ski boots on, not in the Cedars, but at Faraya, um, about 30 minutes. So between leaving my house on the seashore to putting my ski boots on and, and skiing every Sunday during ski season, 30 minutes. So, you know, go to La Jolla, look at La Jolla, pretend that the mountains go another five, 6,000 feet up, and that's what it looks like. It's a gorgeous, gorgeous country. Uh, unfortunately, it's in the worst neighborhood possible. Um, and so it is surrounded by no-gooders. God help them and God help us. All right. So you remember this, uh, I, think we're, I think we're making good progress. I think we should be able to, in about 17 of these lectures together, we, uh, we, we will get there. Now, what I need to impress on you is this, that when a religion, a faith, comes to a place, let's say the mountains of Lebanon, and you're worshiping, you know, these, these pagan gods, idols, and you come there, or you go to Nisbis, or you go to Edessa, or you go to Antioch. Let's do Antioch. Antioch is easier. You don't just arrive and there's a tabula rasa. You know, it's just like clean slate, you know, wash everything away. No! Just like we were talking about the violence, you know, remains with us as an imprint. That when they get there, they receive it, and then it develops within a certain context. And that context is very complex. And it's ingrained, it's part of the culture, it's part basically of the ethnicity, the language, all the existing beliefs that you have to overcome. This is why we keep talking in Catholicism about enculturation, right? You go into a community and you use their culture to, to draw them to the Lord. You don't say you're a bunch of bozos, let me tell you how it's done. You know, it's not a good start. Um, and of course, geography, literature, philosophy, mythology. People think about mythology the wrong way, so maybe I should correct it. A myth doesn't mean it's wrong. It doesn't mean it's untrue. Mythology is how we encapsulate that which is important to us and we pass it on to the, our grandchildren. So mythology is good. You know, this is a way of, of us, uh, what is important for us, our, our fables, uh, right? You know, our, our adages. You know, what are they? They're the distillation of that which has made us who we are, and we want to pass that on uh, to the children. So let me, let me finish with this then today. I want to read this to you. I'll stand here because I can't see from over there. This is Acts 11, 19 through 26. So if you want to write that down and go and read it, I think you would, you would find it uh, quite enlightening in this now perspective. Acts 11, 19 through 26. Now, those who had been scattered by the persecution that arose because of Stephen, so St. Stephen was supposedly a deacon, who am I to say otherwise, uh, and he gave one homily. See, when I was going to be ordained a deacon, I prayed to God that I wouldn't be in the footsteps of St. Stephen, that I would be stoned to death after my first homily went as far as Phoenicia, now you're in Lebanon, Cyprus and Antioch, keyword Antioch, preaching the word to no one but the Jews. Why? Because there's an affinity. You start with something that they know. There were some Cypriots and Cyrenians. Ah, interesting. Cyrenians and Cypriots would have been Greek among them and maybe Syriac as well. 
However, who came to Antioch and began to speak to the Greeks as well, proclaiming the Lord Jesus. The hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. The news about them reached the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and the church in Jerusalem went nuts. What? Pagans? Greeks? This is a Jewish religion. Okay. And they sent Barnabas to investigate. Barnabas went to Antioch. When he arrived and saw the grace of God, he rejoiced and encouraged them all to remain faithful to the Lord in firmness of heart, for he was a good man filled with the Holy Spirit and faith. What's St. Luke telling you? Barnabas was on to something. And a large number of people was added to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus. Tarsus is just uh, northwest uh, of Antioch to look for Saul, and when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year, they met with the church and taught a large number of people, and it was in Antioch that the disciples were first called Christians. So the word Christians originates in Antioch. All right? Okay. You want to learn more? Yeah. Okay. Well, you're going to have to come back next time. Um, gosh, I really, I think we're going to need about 17 of these. I am a very slow speaker, uh, slow speaker, obviously. I apologize. Uh, but this is all new, and I thought a good foundation for us uh, would be good. Um, I know you have to get to your, um, to, the, to, to the Mass at 11. Yes, sir. Podcast on YouTube. Me, podcast? Mm, I'm too bashful for that. Yeah. Bills. But uh, I think, John, you're recording these for those who couldn't be with us. Okay, so here's what I want to do, though. I want to leave you with, a, with something to a prayer of something. Is that okay, John, if I skip to a, a prayer and then we'll come back? Um, what did I have here? Because I, I really want to whet your appetite about what it is to be uh, Syriac. This is, this is um, very important, so keep this in mind. Ephraim Syriac method of theological inquiry. How do you inquire? Not to dominate or subjugate the object of inquiry. Our subject of inquiry in theology is God. God is not a bale of hay for you to measure and weigh. Needless to say, the Syriacs had a cow <laughs> with all the people who were coming up with all this consubstantial. And you have to remember that Greek philosophy did not reach the Syriacs and penetrate into their mindset until the 5th century. Where did they come from then? What was their theology? Jewish. Scriptural. Jewish scriptural. Very much so. Now let's... So not to dominate and not to set out to study him in a dispassionate way either. Here's what he says. Turn me back to your teaching. I wanted to stand back. But I saw that I became the poorer, for the soul does not get any benefit except through converse with you. So not dissecting God and not drawing far away in a scientific way either. And he arrived at his methodology then, he says, but an engagement of love and wonder. Wonder. I take us back to the word that I began with. Wonder. Whenever I have meditated upon you, I have acquired the veritable treasure from you. Whatever aspect of you I have contemplated, a stream has flowed from you. There is no way in which I can contain it. Your fountain, Lord, is hidden from the person who does not thirst for you. Your treasury seems empty to the person who rejects you. Love is the treasurer of your heavenly treasure store. You want to unlock the treasures of God, bask in his love, allow him to love you and love him back. And then he will feed you to the extent that your heart and your spirit are capable of containing him. Which takes us finally, in conclusion, to St. Paul. Why would you want to empty yourself so you can be filled with God? Because if I'm full of myself, then there's no way that God can add anything. We have to empty ourselves, and the Lenten journey is a Lenten of Emptying, emptying oneself so that we can be filled. Okay? All right. You're marvelous, marvelous. Okay, marvelous. I'll, 
I'll see you in a couple of weeks, and we'll we'll dive more deeply. You're gonna you're gonna hear a lot of poetry because this is how they. By the way, uh, they wrote homilies in poems, in verse. Yeah, this is how people would remember because you know they, again they they didn't have uh, books, they didn't have uh, reading and, and writing uh, skills. So so their their poems, their their homilies are are po poems. That's how people would remember them. Okay. Ciao. Bye. God bless you. Go to Mass. No, no.